everybody. I'm Nicole. I'm Lindsay. And I'm Sarah. And together, we're the co-founders of Whale Tales, a living library of cetacean stories. Today, it's another journal club. Whoop, whoop. Plus, a whale tale from a familiar face or fluke. So sit back and enjoy as we dive right in. Welcome and Happy New Year! Yes! It's 2024. We hope it has been wonderful for you thus far. Maybe even full of whales, dolphins, or porpoises. It has been pretty good for us. And we're pretty excited to invite you into a recording we did a couple of months ago for our patrons of a journal club. Hooray! This journal club is going to be sharing maybe some more sensitive content so a bit of a warning we are sharing an article called the harassment and killing of porpoises also known as phokinicide by fish eating southern resident killer whales and this was written by giles et al so if that doesn't sound like your bag no worries the rest of this episode has a ton of really cool and quite cute things in it. <laughs> so maybe in the show notes, we could actually put like the timestamp. I don't know if that's something we can do, Lens. Yep. Of when we move on from Journal Club, which will also be helpful for our patrons who did hear this as part of our patron Journal Club for our 5 and $10 level patrons. So that is doubly helpful if we have that Hooray. timestamp in the show notes. Hooray. <laughs> So without any further ado, enjoy Journal Club. So this month, we read an article that came out in September called Harassment and Killing of Porpoises by Fish Eating Southern Resident Killer Whales by uh, Giles et al. Yes. And uh, as you could tell from the title, isn't it so cozy and fun? (laughs) Yeah. Harassment and Killing killing of Porpoises. porpoises. (laughs) Yes. So yeah, there will be some frank discussion of porpoiseide um non-predation uh killing of porpoises yeah so uh some background on who all was involved in this paper the main author is deborah a giles who you probably heard of if you have been paying attention to killer whales especially southern resident killer whales or just any killer whales finding their way in the salish sea over the last little while she is an expert in all marine mammals of the Salish Sea. She studies killer whale health, physiology, and diet. She does specialize in southern resident orcas and orca population dynamics and reproduction, uh, as well as just the overall ecosystem health of the Salish Sea. She has been studying out of the University of Washington, and she is a science and research director for the nonprofit Wild Orca, while also being a resident scientist at Friday Harbor Laboratories. Uh, the second author is Sarah Tiemann, I think is how we say her name. And she is currently a graduate student at the University of Washington as well. She studies polar bear health, but mm. she also has seven years experience in marine mammal strandings, necropsies, rehabilitation, and population health assessments. And she's looked at everything from pinnipeds in the Pacific Northwest to manatees in Florida, as well as some work with southern resident killer whales so some really really cool research there's also about a million other authors on this paper Mm -hmm. um that's a slight exaggeration but only slight and uh really because this is one of those papers that's looking at combining a lot of observations from researchers who were both actively looking for this as well as saw these sorts of behaviors while they were doing other studies Um, you end up with a lot of authors on this kind of a paper. Mm -hmm. So pretty much anybody who's been working actively with Southern resident killer whales over the last decade or so is going to be named in this paper. Uh, And it was kind of like a fun who's who. It's like, oh, that one. Oh, Mm -hmm. that person. Oh, Rafferty. (laughs) Yeah, I was just going to say, I wrote his name in big letters in my notes. (laughs) Oh, Rafferty. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it's fun. And it's it's really nice to see. I love these kinds of papers. I love seeing, you know, researchers are, are often very collaborative. And it's nice to see that happening. And it's nice to see here we've got people from both sides of the border as well. And, and lots of different stories being shared, which is, you know, what Whale Tales is all about. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
Yeah. So basically, they looked between 1962 and 2020. They mm-hmm. looked at the rep- the reported sightings of Southern kill- resident killer whales um, playing or harassing porpoises, harbor or dolls porpoises in the Salish Sea, and harassing or killing. There was a various number of uh, classifications killed, unknown and alive porpoises afterwards, and some other ways that they sorted this out, including how many uh, killer whales were there, how many porpoises were there, age, sex of both, and, well, not sex of porpoises, but all of that kind of thing. And they came out with a pretty good number of sightings, considering that this is something that people, I guess, in our on our side of the knowledge table of Southern residents is something that's just kind of like offhandedly mentioned as a thing that Southern residents do. And now we have numbers. So between 62 and 2020, they have recorded 78 incidences of Southern residents harassing or killing porpoises in the Salish Sea. 28 of those were classified as a kill and 50 were undetermined. And consumption of the porpoises were never observed, which is something we'll discuss more in the discussion. But that's an important part of this in case you're thinking about potential other killer whales. And there was most of them were harbor porpoises, as you'd expect, and 13 out of the uh, 78 were dolls porpoises. They also looked at some sightings between northern resident killer whales and Alaskan resident killer whales, both of course other ecotypes that eat fish and there was some sightings of these interactions but way less uh in northern residents they were seen five times and alaska they were seen twice Uh, of course these effort windows of time were shorter but again they were um kind of evened out because it was still a normal amount of time that you would see the whale so it wasn't like the it's not like you see northern residents less than southern residents kind of thing it was just displayed less in those two populations. The other things they discussed were pods, so within the southern residents, and it looks like L pod was the first pod to do this behavior, and also the one who has done it the most. They have uh, engaged in this behavior 39 times, J pod 29 and K pod 10. Uh, three incidences involved individuals from two pods at once, and then there were some where the pods were not identified because of various situations. Including the fact that they started, re- like, the first observation is from 1962. Yep, so. before we <laughs> knew who they were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the biggest thing, was that L-Pod was the one who was seen doing it the most, even though it's not all of l pods, Some of the l matrilines and some of the K-matrilines have never been observed doing this. Um, some of that is because their matrilines are very small, but also mm-hmm. some of them are more like, we don't know. Not everybody decided to do it. Or yeah. we just didn't see it. <laughs> that could also be the case. Both very yeah. plausible options. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The other thing that they found was that it was a behavior seen in both sexes fairly equally. And it was seen mostly in juvenile uh, killer whales, but not significantly more than it was seen in other stages of killer whale's life so uh fully adult um calf and um post-menopausal, post-menopausal or post-reproductive post-reproductive yeah. they were all seen doing it but um juveniles were seen the most yeah yeah and so from this data set and the stats and analysis that they performed they came to some pretty interesting conclusions um or like suggestions of conclusions and a lot of it really ties in with similar patterns of behavior in other like high level and apex predators in other ecosystems so like uh terrestrial animals basically do are have been seen to do similar non-predatory killing like or killing of animals that they could prey on but they don't prey on um and it seems like there's a lot of overlap between the sort of guesses at why they would do these so first of all it seems to be that this a lot of the times the behavior is consistent with like a definition of play 
um, where the definition of play is something like the behavior doesn't contribute to survival. It's spontaneous, but intentional. It's pleasurable. It represents a modification of an inherent behavior. It's repeated, but not rigid. And it doesn't occur when they're doing other behavioral things like foraging, breeding, or defense. And also play is more associated with younger individuals. And so they think it's thought to be developmentally significant. This is from like a generic animal definition of play, mm. basically. So yeah, they, they this paper finds that uh, a lot of the porpoise harassing is consistent with the definition of play. And also that they are known to engage in like killer whales in general are known to engage in practice hunting, which would be catching and playing with or manipulating prey. And this is performed both by young individuals and by adults. Um, and so that might be part of the ways that um, they teach their young how to hunt. And so maybe porpoise harassment and porpoiseide could be a form of hunting training, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting. They've seen similar behaviors with other populations uh, hunting or harassing and killing not porpoises. Uh, for example, big killer whales and killer whale populations off South Africa, Argentina, and Antarctica have been seen hunting and sometimes even consuming marine birds. And also big killer whales have been um, anecdotally observed harassing salmon throughout their mm, range. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the inverse yeah, of it. Yeah. Like they're both practicing the hunting behavior, um, especially because a uh, large salmon and juvenile porpoises are like kind of the same size yeah. which was oh. the thing that like stuck out to me yeah as mm -hmm. really fa i had never even though i knew those two facts i had never yeah. put them side by side it in was head. yeah when i was reading it i was like wait a second because that was the <laughs> yeah. important part of the results that i forgot to say was that it was mostly neonate or juvenile porpoises they had observed mm -hmm. adult porpoises but most of them were younger ones so again they are smaller what was it like Ne uh, young porpoises are about 100 centimeters and uh, full-size Chinook salmon is 90 centimeters. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, basically the and same. And it's like, especially, you know, as salmon population is, you know, in decline here, it's like a lower risk maybe mm -hmm. opportunity. Like you're not going to scare the salmon away and you don't really care if you scare away the porpoises, yeah. like if it's a failed attempt yeah. at hunting. Especially because porpoise um, populations are rising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Horrible porpoise populations. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll get into that. And another possible explanation for porpoise harassing is like a displaced epimiletic behavior. That's how you say, that, say that word. Right. I, don't, I didn't know what it was. Ep epimiletic. Yeah, epimiletic behavior. So I'd heard of epimiletic behavior, but not by this term. So I, it, uh, luckily they explain it in the paper. And it happens when an individual shows some sort of like helpful action to some to an individual that's ill dying or dead so in cetaceans we've seen it where adults or other individuals will like keep one of their conspecifics like another killer whale from their population like keep them afloat or attempting to resuscitate it there's like obviously the mother pushing her deceased calf on the surface of the water and so that's an epimiletic behavior and so a displaced epimiletic behavior is doing that but to not your own species. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really know why they would do that, but that's sort of like what the, like one of the thoughts of what this behavior could be. Yeah. And because they also, they mentioned some of the other, there's been a lot of odd sightings of different species of um, killer whales with pilot whales and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. And every time one of these shows up, everyone in the world is like, what the hell is happening? And yeah. this could be one of the reasons, or it could just be that we don't know. Yeah. things yeah so one of the other main explanations for this non-predatory killing of prey that is has been seen in other species is to avoid prey competition so basically like a t an apex predator would kill competitors mm. of their preferred food item but there's really not any like dietary overlap between southern residents and porpoises in the salish sea so it's pretty unlikely and then the other part of the discussion that they talk about is sort of who is doing this behavior and who they're doing it towards. So first of all, yeah, as we've said in the Salish Sea, there's dolls porpoises and harbor porpoises. And this study found that way more of these attacks were against harbor porpoises versus doll porpoises. But it also 
might not be really anything to do with that because at the same time that these porpoise harassment behaviors have been increasing, the numbers of dolls porpoises has been decreasing and the numbers of harbor porpoises has been increasing dramatically. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes sense, like math wise. Also, dolls are way harder to catch. Yes. Yeah. And dolls are way faster. (laughs) Yep. So all of that, like it's not really anything to do with like preference. They prefer one or the other or whatever. Yeah. Um, Or like one is more annoying or I don't know anything like that. Um, So yeah, as Lindsay said, they have seen uh, porpoise harassment and killing behaviors within um, all three pods, L, K, and J. And it was first seen in L pod. And they are, it seems like the behavior is taught and repeated and retained within specific matcher lines. So L5 and two of her offspring in the L9 matcher line, L58 and L73, were they were um, identified back in 1987 harassing a harbor seal. And then also they were among the first whales identified harassing a porpoise in 1992 and in 1994. So basically like this match line seems like maybe at least the first observed ones. And then not all match lines, but it does seem that because of how it's sort of clustered in certain match lines that the porpoise harassing and killing behavior was spread via social learning, which basically it falls into the definition of culture. That's kind of like what culture is, is like sharing behaviors that you learn socially. Yeah. And basically it just seems like, like other predators in other ecosystems, killer whales are capable of chasing animals that they don't kill and whether they don't kill them on purpose or because the animal gets away. Um, So that happens. And also that they do kill animals that they don't eat, which can include prey and non-prey items Mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And some of it might be part of their culture of how they learn to hunt or learn to develop and teach their young other skills. So yeah, there's lots of interesting bits of information. And also if you're interested in these kinds of like social behaviors, there's tons Mm -hmm. of links to really like interesting references like from all over the world. Yeah. Including a bunch of terrestrial stuff. Yes. Because that's where they got a lot of this information from about killing, um, playing with and killing things that are, could be prey or not prey, but still killing them and not eating them. It's, there's not that many large predators terrestrially that like are as prey specific as the resident killer whales. So Yeah. Like there's, there's, they're much more strongly, like they never eat these porpoises. Yeah. Whereas in terrestrial ones, it's kind of like 50, 50 or, you know, something like, yes. And that happens may or may not. in with the bigs because like I've, yes. I've seen hunting, like training hunts with bigs, with seals mm-hmm. and harper porpoises. And sometimes they eat it and sometimes they don't. Yeah. And it's almost like this is completely anthropomorphic and completely also just like my interpretation anthropomorphized of of what it is but it's it's the essence of like i've played with this so much it's not worth eating yeah or to put it in another very personal to me way like my two-year-old who really really likes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches but sometimes if he's just been playing with it around his plate, it doesn't look like a peanut uh-huh. butter and jelly sandwich anymore because yeah. he's been playing with it so much. And then he won't eat it, even though mm-hmm. it still is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It still is. It's just deconstructed. Exactly. So it's like, you know, that yes. probably doesn't look like a harbor seal anymore or a harbor purpose. Yeah. Who knows? Mm-hmm. With the social learning aspect of it, if play, culture, all of this stuff, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the uh, salmon hat wearing mm. of mm. these s- same animals. So who knows why these guys do anything, really? They are the salmon hat wearers. Uh, but that is, of course, another form of behavior that was seen in one pod, in K-pod, that was passed along um, in J and L pod and mm-hmm. was seen for a while and then was stopped and then was seen again briefly and then never came back. And we really have no idea what that was about, but it is a form, a great example of social learning in between these three pods of culture and play. We you know one assumes yeah. with that incident. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Anybody have any other thoughts? Um, one of the times they were uh, seen harassing five to 15 porpoises which is an insane amount of 
things to yeah. all be happening at once. It's true. <laughs> Sounds like chaos. Yeah. And they do talk a lot about the observation bias of southern resident killer whales, which do def- yeah. does affect the sightings amounts, of course. In the when they started collecting the data, these a lot of them were seen while the people out on the boats were trying to harpoon the killer whales to take mm-hmm. them to yeah. shore. And now, of course, they are not doing that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. observations of southern resident killer whales and also this behavior have increased dramatically in the past 20, 25 years. But, of course, they have modeling things to deal with that because they are scientists mm-hmm. who understand stats. Yeah. Not yes, unlike and me. observation bias, yes. for sure. Yeah. The other thing I have, which is morbid is that a lot of the times when there were multiple animals uh, interacting with this behavior they were trying to keep the porpoise out of the water it seemed like and that was just my morbid version of keepy uppy (laughs) oh Oh, yeah anyway that was that was my notes (laughs) um my only other thought was just i love that this one and also our last one that we um, covered were are both like collations or collections of various data sets from decades from multiple sources like researchers in two different countries naturalists whale watchers nonprofits, like all kinds of like collected data and i just think it's really great especially in such a like small community mm-hmm. that obviously marine animals don't care about borders and they don't you know that there's um such great um collection and collaboration of this data for future study absolutely yay go team yeah and also one last thing or one thing to note is that we do actually have a story about this from ashley from 2014 which they don't list all of the sightings in this paper which was sad because i wanted to comb through and see if it was in there i'm sure that it actually is because she was on her whale watching boat which sighting was recorded it was with jpod um yeah i'll link that in the show notes so you guys can read that as well j and l pod yeah Uh very cool l 118 j26 j47 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 l95 plus i assume others those are just the ones that you listed that's so cool yeah we also have a story from janine about bigs playing with a salmon so there you go there, are, it's happening out there. Crazy things <laughs> happening out there in the Salish Sea. Just gotta be out there more. Yeah, it's my personal it. goal. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, did you have anything else? No, I think you guys covered everything. I I just loved the article, and I, you know what? I will say this: it's a really readable article. Yeah, Not all it is. journal articles yeah. are, and that's okay. And we'll still cover uh, some of those more like really really technical ones in Journal Club, but it's nice. When we yeah. have journal articles that we can share, especially free access yeah, journal yeah. articles where you can read the whole thing for free. I absolutely love free science. Uh, and it's really readable. It was just yeah. so highly recommend. Yeah. And it's also nice of like reading through because, of course, it lists our friends in Southern Resident yeah. Killer Whales, but it also lists our friends the researchers of like, I know this guy. I know this guy's an aide. Yeah. I remember yeah. this guy. Uh, and woman and this yeah, person familiar face men. familiar faces. yeah familiar names all around which is nice and just yeah. yeah i like reading articles about these guys yeah before we continue with the rest of the episode we want to take a moment to tell you about how you can support our podcast and everything we do at whale tales you can join us on patreon by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash whale tales for a dollar a month, we've got the porpoise level, five dollars a month, the dolphin level, and surprise, ten dollars a month, the whale level. <laughs> and each level comes with a variety of perks, including polls, thank you postcards, access to extended interviews or extra stories that our guests share with us. Plus, you have the opportunity of producing your own fun flipper fact segment of the pod. And we have special extra podcasts because we just love to chat with each other, especially about whales. We have a journal club episode out for our five and ten dollar level patrons every other month or so where we do what we did in this episode. We talk about a new or really interesting journal article that we come across and kind of talk about how they did it and what 
what came from the article. And then our whale level patrons also get access to a special patron only podcast called Whale Tales Watches, where we watch something that is somewhat marine biology related, and then we talk about it. <laughs> In our latest episode, we watched and read double, double the work, The Ring of Endless Light. And next, Ooh. Whale Tales Watches, Sarah is particularly excited so about, excited. as will all Star Trek fans be. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Thank you so much to our patrons. You are amazing and help us be able to make corny Star Trek jokes in our podcast. <laughs> Yay! Oh, thanks so much, patrons. I'm very excited. Not that I need any excuse to watch that movie, but it's good to get to force my best friends to watch it, too. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and if you aren't able to support us financially, we completely understand. There's still lots of things, though, that you can do to help us out uh, that we really appreciate. You can leave us a rating or a review on your podcast platform of choice. Man, when we get these, Lindsay usually is the one that gets them and sends them in the group chat, and we are very excited all day. It's, it's awesome. Best. And you can always just, like, tell your cetacean-y science podcast-loving friends about Whale Tales and about the podcast so that they can listen, too. Plus, you can follow us on social media at whaletales underscore org and send us your feedback so that we can keep making this podcast even better and more in line with what you like to put in your ears. <laughs> now, does everybody know what time it is? I do. Do, 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 fun flipper fact. It's time for a fun flipper fact. <laughs> okay. Today's fun flipper fact might be my favorite that has ever happened. Not because I think the fact itself is so interesting, though it is, but mm. because this is a Patreon produced fun flipper fact. And our patron Kelly, but really actually Kelly's two incredibly adorable kids, Max, who's five, and Henry, who's two, sent us not just a question, which would already be amazing, because we absolutely love getting questions from anybody, especially from our patrons, but Max and Henry sent us a video <laughs> asking this question, and, oh, I don't know if I should spoil it in the podcast or not. We're going to put it up on our social media. I know that, Lindsay, you said when we were chatting off, off mic that it's not going to be up for a couple of weeks, so this is maybe just a little bit of a, like, plug. Everybody, please go follow our social media <laughs> handles. So that you can see this video when it goes up because it's so cute. They're so cute. And I think yeah, I'm actually true. not gonna spoil it. I think I think you're just gonna have to go watch it to see Indeed. why they're so cute. <laughs> Good call. But we will insert the audio of Max and Henry asking their question now. Hello, my name is Max and this is Henry, and we were wondering what is the biggest part of orcas ever found, and what is the biggest part of whales or dolphins ever found? Thank you for answering our question. Okay, Max and Henry, and Kelly, if you're listening, thank you so much for this question, and thank you for being fans of the podcast and everything that we do at Whale Tales. We are so excited to hear from you, and it was really, really fun researching your question, because this kind of question, especially when we're talking about numbers is not something that any of us know off the top of our head. We definitely need to go and do some research because it could change at any time. So also mm -hmm. a bit of a disclaimer, what I am going to share as the answer to your question today is the answer as best as we could figure it out today, January 2024. But this could totally change because somebody could see a group even bigger than this, like, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, really fun question. Also, another quick note about uh, sort of definitions of words. While Max and Henry asked us for the largest pod of dolphins and orcas, pod is a really funny word because I think most of us, before we really start researching cetaceans, use pod to just describe a group of dolphins or porpoises or whales. You're like, oh, hey, there's, like, five gray whales. That's a pot of gray whales. And it's only if you really start studying, especially orcas specifically, that pod has a really like rigorous definition to it, which is a group, yes, so a group of cetaceans, but who are known to be biologically related, but not immediately biologically related, like a matriline of orcas, for example, like a mother and all its descendants. A pod is kind of like the 
the bigger family tree of a few different matro lines. Think, again, J-Pod, K-Pod, and L-Pod in the Southern Resident Killer Whales. Now, I'm going to guess, Max and Henry, you were using the word the way that I certainly used the word before I started studying these animals, and that you wanted to know what's the largest group of orcas and the largest group of dolphins overall that have ever been seen by people. So that's what we researched. And it was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so the largest group of orcas that have ever been seen is probably some orcas in Norway. Because mm. the Norwegian and Barents Seas are areas where there are sometimes about 3,000 individual killer whales. Good lord. <laughs> now, not all 3,000 are going to be seen at once though. And every year, the highest chance you have of seeing a large gathering of killer whales is between October and January, which is when the herring run happens in the Troms yeah. region. So, Which is why you should listen to Christina's episode, or just go to our website and look at Christina's amazing stories, and also maybe one day we're going go to go to Norway and go whale great. watching. Please. Someday. Patreon <laughs> yeah. goals. <laughs> yep. Um, and in the herring run season, in the seas of Norway, you can see groups of between 50 and 60 orcas at a time. Wow. Which is That's pretty incredible. But maybe not as incredible as the answer to the second part of your question, which is what was the largest group of dolphins ever seen? I had my eyes pop out of my head when I found <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> So this is documented with pictures, just like the orcas, but like really, really crazy, crazy, crazy pictures. And it's from about 10 years ago. Actually, maybe more, more like 11 years ago. Yeah. Now, it was a group of common dolphins spotted off the coast of San Diego in February of 2013. And based on all of the photos, they estimated 100,000 common dolphins yeah. all migrating together. Yes, you heard that right. One hundred thousand common dolphins yeah that's too many dolphins like if you if i was gonna guess a number i would have said like a thousand that seems like yeah in the right ballpark no a hundred thousand yeah i've definitely known like they do talk about super pods up there down there of like five thousand or so so i would have said something around that but this that's that's insane. It's so many dolphins. So many dolphins. <laughs> it's all the dolphins. No, except it's not because there's millions and millions of dolphins, but it's so So cool. many dolphins. Uh, and we will include in our show notes a link to where you can see some of the pictures of that. They, they call it a mega super pod, which makes sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> yes. Like super they mojo, kojo, dad, <laughs> whatever the Ken's dream house is. Jojo house? Yeah, yeah. Dojo, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so Max and Henry and Kelly especially, thank you so much for your question. Thank you for yes. supporting us at Whale Tales and thank you for being incredible, incredible cetacean fans. Hooray! Yay. If you would like to produce your own fun flipper fact segment of the pod, you can do so by becoming a patron. So you can also be really cute or, you know, your regular amazing awesome self, whether that is something that you would consider as cute as Max and Henry or not. We don't judge. We love all of our patrons. <laughs> <laughs> and we love all questions. We do. Yes. So we would love to hear your question, and uh, we would love to dive deep into some really cool research to learn some new stuff ourselves. Thank you so much. Our whale tale this month comes from Five Star Whale Watching in Victoria and features a familiar face or fluke. Uh, we were really excited to get this story. Unfortunately, our contact at Five Star Whale Watching lost their voice. So without further ado, I will read this exciting story that we have about our familiar friend, Gnarly. Yay! Yay! So in this fall, in particular in the later stages of December, we, at Five Star Whales, in Victoria, encountered BCZ0131 Gnarly a number of times. Our last viewing of Gnarly was in October 2015, and we actually thought they had stopped coming to the Sailor Sea. Yet Gnarly showed up again this fall with another whale. Yeah. The last recording of Gnarly in the Sailor Sea According to Happy Whale, was in 2016. Gnarly was first reported in our area by Cascadia Research on the 26th of August in 1990, which I did not know, wow. near Wilpuros Bank, BC. He was spotted again by Cascadia at Swiftsure Bank on July 
six, 1996. So it's very sporadic, this one. Indeed. According to Happy Whale, Gnarly spends winter in and around Mexico, and his tail is easy to recognize with its distinctive pattern and shape, which may have come from entanglement, mm. but we don't know. Huh. So yeah, thanks for sending in that story. Five Star will post mm -hmm. it on social because they have some great photos and videos of Gnarly over Christmas Ugh. with their friend. Who knows what they were doing? Working on making a, a baby Gnarly. Who knows? Maybe? Or... <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, just... Maybe Gnarly's, Just like, eaten. extra adventurous and so goes to, like, more different places and... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's it's interesting because of how some, like, so many humpbacks are so strong with coming back every yeah. year. And sometimes another one's come here and then we don't know. It's not <laughs> like we're not looking in the other places that they go. Yeah, exactly. So, Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Anyway. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thanks for sending that story in, everybody. And you can follow them at Five Star Whales, all one word with spelling the number five on Instagram, and we'll put their website in the show notes as well. Sweet, thanks. Hooray! I was so happy to see that Gnarly was back over Christmas in the Sailor Sea. Yay. You can learn more about Gnarly in our blog post, One Whale, Two Numbers, <laughs> which talks about the work that our friends at Happy Whale are doing as well, or some of our sightings from our storytellers in. 2016, 2015, were very helpful with actually Happy Whale getting Gnarly's numbers down and uh, start tracking them on their mysterious adventures across the seas with their <laughs> weird <laughs> fluke. So fun. Oh, Gnarly. <laughs> Before we wrap up the podcast this month, we always like to share a call to action so that you can learn more about how you can help whales and the oceans around you. And continuing our uh i guess accidental trend of <laughs> this episode being brought to you by people in addition to us um our call to action this month comes from the folks at salish sea stormwater monitoring they are a cohort of volunteers that live along the shoreline of the u.s side of the salish sea and they help city governments by steering limited uh manpower towards discoveries of stormwater pollution sources which is very cool you can learn more about what they do uh, by following them on Instagram, they're at Salish Sea Stormwater. And also, they just started a podcast from Sea to Sky. So yeah, check out their awesome call to action and learn more. Hi, everyone. This is Shanti from the Salish Sea Stormwater Monitoring Project. Our small nonprofit is aiming to make a big difference in the Pacific Northwest. We monitor stormwater outfalls in seven different cities for pollution, bacteria, and heavy metals. Our mission is to save the endangered Chinook salmon, which are the main food source of southern resident orca whales. The native Chinook salmon are facing the threat of extinction, partly due to stormwater pollution levels. Did you know that stormwater is actually the largest category of water pollution. Despite this fact, no city in Washington state is required to treat or monitor their stormwater discharges. So that's where we come in. Thanks to our team's discoveries, city stormwater managers can take action to clean up pollution sources. If you're passionate about ocean conservation and want to help make an impact, volunteer with us by emailing volunteer at stormwater salishseaorg Join us in our mission to leave our seas cleaner and safer for generations to come. To learn more about our work, follow us on Instagram at Salish Sea Stormwater. Thanks for listening. Very cool. That's oh. so cool. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Thank you also, for doing if, that. If you're interested in stormwater and storm drains, an appropriate call to action right now. I don't know about all cities, but City of Vancouver does a thing where you can like sign up online to look after a storm drain. And mm -hmm. basically that just means clearing debris out of it periodically so that it doesn't flood. And that's a great thing to do at this time of year and also all year round. So yeah, yeah. yay storm drains and yay. looking after our storm water. It's very important. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And I think that about brings us to the end of this episode where... I think we've had the most people on. <laughs> I think almost. Yeah. It was really, yeah. really fun. And we would yeah. love to hear your thoughts on this or any episode. So please visit our website, whale-tales.org, and find links to all our social media handles so that you can drop us a line. You can also head to our website to subscribe to the podcast. You can learn more about supporting us and becoming a patron. And while you're there, check out over 1,300 whale, dolphin, and porpoise stories. That's whale-tales.org. Tales like the stories, not tales like the animal. 
And if you've seen a citation, we would love to add your story to our library. Click on the share link on our website, or you can contact us on social media. We're at whaletales underscore org. Or you can email us a voice memo and tell us all about your incredible citation encounter. Next month's episode is a mailbag. So we are going to be answering even more people's questions, whether they are patrons or not. So if you have a citation question, we want to hear it. And the deadline for you to get us those questions is February 12th. So don't miss out. Finally, we want to acknowledge that we recorded today's episode on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples and the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, as well as the homelands of the Tawasin First Nation. Thank you, everybody, so much, and we hope you have a whaley great day.